everyone. Welcome to The Presumption. I'm Sarah Azari, together with Jim Griffin, my prestiged uh, partner in crime. Hi, Jim. Hey, Sarah. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. And Matt, of course, our wonderful producer and our very, very special guest today, Dick Harpootlian. Welcome, Dick. Thank you, Sarah. It's good to be here. I spend way too much time alone with Jim, so having y'all here with me uh, is a welcome relief. I I feel terrible for you. I feel terrible for you. All right. Well, let's um, begin by, look, everybody knows both you and Jim as Alec Murdoch's attorneys, but there's obviously so much more to you and your career. Um, Dick began his career as a prosecutor for the Fifth Circuit Solicitor's Office, covering two counties in South Carolina. He later became a deputy solicitor, supervising dozens of attorneys and support staff. Now, you know, for the rest of us uh, around the country, solic- when we hear solicitor, we think prostitution. Um, but the solicitor actually means district attorney uh, right. to the rest of us. Um, and uh, Dick has prosecuted hundreds of serious felony cases, including 12 death penalty cases and dozens of other murder cases. In 1983, he co-prosecuted Donald Peewee Gaskins, the largest mass murderer in the history of the state, who committed a contract killing on death on a death row inmate while housed on death row. Dick successfully obtained a conviction. Um, I love when prosecutors uh, take credit for convictions because her job is so incredibly difficult. Um, and Pee Wee Gaskins was sentenced to death and later executed. Um, just weeks prior to his execution, Gaskins attempted to have Dick's young daughter kidnapped and held hostage. The plot was thwarted by law enforcement when they received a tip from one of those that Gaskins had recruited to do the job. Uh, We'll be talking in depth about Gaskins with Dick uh, in this episode. Uh, Dick began his career in private practice in 1983, later became the Fifth Circuit Solicitor from 1991 to 1995. During that tenure, he prosecuted and obtained convictions in several high-profile cases, ranging from murder to drugs and public corruption. Uh, Dick's practice consists of criminal defense and civil plaintiffs matters. He's defended two death penalty cases and dozens of other serious felony cases in both state and federal courts. Last but certainly not least, um, Dick was elected to the South Carolina Senate in November 2018 and continues to serve in that role. So welcome, my friend. Well, thank um, you. It's good. It's good to be here. Um, <laughs> good to see you again, Sarah. We spent some wonderful time at CrimeCon together. Um, yeah, and yeah. and at uh, Gourmet Shop. <laughs> gourmet Shop, always a Gourmet Shop, absolutely. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to start off with the Dick and Jim show, right? Um, uh, you guys work so well together, and I know how valuable it is to be able to collaborate with a colleague. Um, on certain cases, but I think a lot of us have questions. A lot of our viewers certainly have questions about how you guys got to know each other, how you started working together. How do you sort of um, divide up uh, the work? You know, I'm going to say this when um, I I followed the uh, Murdoch case since the murders happened. And at that time um, there was like one newspaper that was covering it. I think it was Greenville something and I was like subscribing so I could see what's new in the case. And I was curious about who you guys are, you know, um, why these two guys? And uh, in my mind, when I looked up your profiles, I thought, okay, this makes sense. Jim Griffin is a white collar lawyer, so he's gonna do all the financial stuff. And Dick Harpulian is like the street lawyer, he's gonna do all the murder stuff. As it turned out, your murder trial was a financial crime trial for three weeks. So um, tell me about your relationship and how you guys work together. So, and Jimmy will probably correct me on this if I'm wrong, but um, when I was in practice, uh, private practice, after I left the DA's office and before I ran for DA, um, mm-hmm. I, I think Jim was at the U.S. Attorney's Office at that time. Um, and so he was prosecuting. We never really crossed paths. Um, but when I left this, the, in, in sort of as a backstory, when I was in private practice, I, I got hired to defend a guy who had been accused of paying off on a video poker machine, which everybody assumed was against the law. Mm-hmm. Um, I ended up arguing in front of the judge that there was a statutory exemption that you had to sort of read things together. And the judge agreed with me and the Supreme Court affirmed legalizing video poker in South Carolina, which became mm-hmm. quickly a 
probably a hundred, several hundred million dollars, not billion dollar a year um, enterprise. And we made, I made several people huge fortunes just by that. By the way, I got paid twenty five hundred dollars on that case. Um, and so, uh, no percentage of uh, of the state's winnings. No, no, I don't think I could take percentage. It was a criminal okay. case. I mean, and it was typically a kind of case that you'd work out for a suspended sentence or probation. But um, this guy apparently had a history with the DA up. And it wasn't here. It was up in um, in uh, Lancaster um, County. So. Um, the Supreme Court affirmed and video poker became legal. I went into the, uh, I got elected DA in 1990. Um, in 91, um, I began my career there, my four year elected term, ran for attorney general that in 94, not a good year for Democrats, lost and went out into private practice in January of uh, 95. And in 94, on the ballot was a referendum on local option on video poker and 11 counties um, voted no. Uh, and these were pretty lucrative counties for uh, the video poker uh, uh, industry. So they uh, came to me um, and wanted to know if I could litigate that 12 no county um, ban. And, uh, you know, again, I'm just coming out of four years of doing nothing but criminal. Uh, I'd gotten to know Jim a little bit. And so uh, we did the case together and we won. Um, and struck down uh, this um, local option, and again made the industry a whole bunch of money. And I don't, I don't remember what we charged him, but it was not enough. Um, but definitely not enough. I, definitely. I think you guys. I don't know. It's like this is a pattern for you. So <laughs> not getting so, paid. <laughs> so out of that, came, that later. <laughs> right, out of that came a relationship that we began working on. You know, different kinds of cases together. Some criminal, some civil. Um, and, you know, that relationship's gone on for whatever, whatever that is, 30 years. Um, and, uh, you know, he has his practice. I have my practice, but we come together. When um, uh, Paul Murdaugh was being investigated and charged in the boat case, mm-hmm. <clears throat> his father, Alec, who I didn't know, um, went to his father, Randolph Murdaugh, who was the DA down there when I was the DA here and we had a pretty good relationship and his father encouraged him to hire me. I met with them at Moselle um, and immediately seeing what was going on, got Jim involved. And to be frank with you, Jim and Paul hit it off uh, a lot more than he and I'm not, I'm not renowned for my bedside manner. Um, (laughs) Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, and, and, but Jim and, and Paul uh, hit it off. I mean, I got along with Maggie and Alec and all of them fine, but um, I, he developed a relationship with Paul and I had Paul and Maggie in my office and, and, and on a number of occasions during that year before they both got murdered. Um, so we worked together on getting that case ready for trial. And I thought, uh, and I think Jim thought uh, that we had a pretty good shot at getting an acquittal or at least a hung jury on the boat case. Okay. And of course, obviously, then um, things went to uh, to hell when uh, the murders happened. So, but Jim and I have done drug cases together. We've done civil cases together. Um, class actions. We we've, we've done class actions together, right? So, I mean, right. we we and we work well together because I don't I can't remember a single time that we've argued. You know, other than debating, but I'm talking about a serious argument. Um, because uh, my ego is so small, I normally just defer to, defer to Jim. I'm just such a humble, laid back kind of guy. Now, in all seriousness, so your your small ego and his big big ego kind of balance each other right? balance, so in the middle. So in, in all seriousness, seriousness, no, though. I mean, I would concede that Jim's ability to analyze, manipulate, and write the law um, is extraordinary, and I I, I would tell you that um, I've never seen him. Um, not turn I, turn in the best and and just extraordinary product. Um, he's he's kind of he's kind of. I mean, it's 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 kind of incredible. Like he'll I'll be like, oh, you know, maybe we need to read this book before we interview this guest. And like two hours later, he's like, I read it. <laughs> I'm like, <yeah>. what? <laughs> I mean, he really, yeah. Study, and, study. But but um, my uh, I mean, having been a prosecutor. Uh, in the mid seventies when um, 
no DNA, no fingerprints, no video, no anything. I mean, back then it was sort of a uh, Wild West kind of prosecution. Yeah. No, by the way, they didn't have to tell us about an alibi. There was no reciprocal mm -hmm. discovery. It was so my forte is um, the ability to um, not need all of that and sort of react. Um, and not that I don't understand the law. I, I work diligently to, to, to be able to make a legal argument, but mm -hmm. I'm much more um, fluid in a courtroom than many, many lawyers are and um, mm -hmm. are my sort of fly by the seat of the pants approach and Jim's very focused uh, legal approach. Mm -hmm. they, they, they just sort of magically yeah. come together. Um, yeah. And in terms of who does what, you know, again, we divvy it up based on who wants to do what. And I don't think we've ever disagreed about that in any mm -hmm. case. We've ever had. So it's just it, like picking just, up guns and pointing it to the prosecution's table. Is something no, that was, as I said, in you the feel comfortable doing, but Jim might not feel comfortable. Jim, Jim might not be. And of course, he would never say <laughs> tempting, as I said. Um, but um, it, it's, uh, uh, you know, we have strong feelings about what happened in that trial. I'm not going to comment on it because right. it's under appeal and we've got all kinds of yes. motion. Um, pending. Um, we are going to have a hearing next, a week from Friday tomorrow. I don't know when this will run, but uh, uh, Friday the 17th on the, with the judge on the financial crimes jury selection process. And Jim will be filing a motion um, mm -hmm. today on that. But, but the, the fact of the matter is um, we both have, uh, I think, a deep-seated belief that Alec Murdoch did not kill Maggie and Paul. Yeah, me too. <laughs> did, he, did, he yeah. Steal, did he steal a bunch of money? Yes. Absolutely. Did he commit despicable acts in how he treated his clients? Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But did he kill Maggie and Paul? Right. I don't think he did. And yeah. I think the forensic case, if we'd ever, if we'd started with the murder case instead of the financial case, I think the outcome would have been a lot different. Right. So before we talk about some, up, you know, the latest updates in Murdoch, um, and, you know, speaking of you and Jim, uh, what are some fun, I mean, I know Jim has his own stories and highlights, but tell us a good Jim story. It doesn't have to be in the courtroom. It could be None a courtroom. Oh, you don't really don't. You really, you, you <laughs> really, really Jim is going to have to have all that edited out. Um, he is, <laughs> we, um, yeah. uh, we have traveled uh, the country together doing depositions. There's the waitress in San Francisco story, which he's not going to want me to tell. <laughs> Why? Uh, that sounds like a good one. <laughs> or the witness in the Harley Davidson um, <laughs> class action case. You don't want me to tell. Um, I mean, there's a number of stories. And None we of don't want to talk about the hot tub in Dallas. We really don't. No, we don't want to talk. What? About okay. You tub. know, I'm sorry. This is a complete tease. <laughs> a waitress, a hot tub, but, but, a Harley but, Davidson. No, 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 no. You right, got to pick a couple no, of those. <laughs> these, depos these deposition safaris we go on, whether it's to the West Coast or to uh, Dallas or Houston or uh, where was Harley? Did Cleveland? Was that Cleveland? Um, uh, in Indianapolis, I think. But right. I in Chicago. Remember Chicago and the steakhouse? Yeah, we... we those are the most fun things, and we can't talk about them, you know, publicly because they are so much fun. But the, uh, I, I tell you, Sarah, one of my um, favorite Dick stories is the, the uh, Democratic primary was going on in in South Carolina. Barack Obama was running against Hillary Clinton, and and it was, they were gearing up for the vote. And Bill Clinton was in town, and and I don't know what 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 it said been said or heard and they can speak to it but i hear i hear on the radios you know bill clinton using dick arputlian's name and he's very angry using dick arputlian's and then i pull over <clears throat> pull by dick's office and see what was going on and dick is like being bombarded by calls from the obama campaign and and you, you got your own chapter called fear and loathing lizard's thicket in a in a book about game changer didn't you dick Yes. Um, yeah, tell, so, tell, what was that about? Okay, so let me back up a little bit. Um, you got to start with the late 80s, early 90s. Well, yeah, no, wait, wait. When was he governor? Yeah, it probably mid 80s. Um, Bill Clinton used to come um, to South Carolina and stay with our governor, Dick Riley. Um, and I met him then. He was not running for president. And Hillary came up, had dinner with him a couple of times. And 
I was, you know, very impressed uh, with with um, with uh, with Bill. And mm -hmm. so when he ran um, in 92 for president, I was signed on early, went to New Hampshire, went door to door with him, um, uh, you know, went through the whole Jennifer Flowers deal with him for right. kids don't quite remember all that. But uh, it was what a about pretty the Monica day. What about today? You talk about Monica Lewinsky. <laughs> you know, well, it, that's fast forward, but so I was very close to them. And when, um, you know, he served two terms, and I was in the White House many, many times with. Him. Um, and so, fast forward to two thousand and seven, uh, Hillary's talking about running for president, and I, in two thousand four, I'd been at the Boston Convention, and um, seen. Barack Obama gave that just extraordinary speech and was galvanized by him. But anyway, um, fast forward to 2007. Um, I had a call from um, um, Rick Wade, who was a buddy of mine, who went later on worked in the Obama administration, African-American guy here, very, very, very talented, who called me and said, look, Senator Obama's going to be in town on Saturday. He'd like to have a cup of coffee with you. And I said, well, you know, I'm a Hillary person. I'm going to be for Hillary. Um, and he said, no, I have a cup of coffee with him. So I went down to the Marriott here and had a, just me and him, cup of coffee, talked. And I walked out and I endorsed Barack Obama. Now, I had been um, a form, I'd been state chairman of this Democratic Party in 98 and um, all the way through 2003. So I had some profile with the Democrat, statewide profile with the Democratic Party. And I was the earliest guy to endorse him um, and got involved in the campaign um, pretty heavily in the fall of 07. And then, you know, Obama lost Iowa and New Hampshire and came in here and this was do or die. And we had, um, you know, a whole crew come in from everybody from Valerie, uh, Jarrett, to Samantha Power going door to door here. And it became sort of a, uh, hand to hand combat. And two days before the prior day, two days before the primary, Bill Clinton gave us a, a press conference in which, he intimated the only reason that Barack Obama had any cachet with any voter was because he was black. And so I said, um, uh, he said that at a restaurant called Lizard's Thicket, um, which, um, well, no, no, he said that in Aiken. He came up to Lizard's Thicket after I said, uh, you know, he, Bill Clinton's beginning to remind me of Lee Atwater implying and inferring that, you know, there's a racist Southern strategy thing going on here. Yeah. Um, Clinton was asked by CNN that somebody shoved a microphone. What do you say about what Dick Harpoon, Dick Harpoon compared you to, to, to um, Lee Atwater? And he turned, you can see him on camera, turned and walked away and then stopped and came back and just unloaded on my ass. Um, <laughs> so, you know, that gave me the ability to tickle him a little bit more and, I mean, he got angrier and angrier and angrier. And, you know, he, he be, this this became the dominant story that he called, basically made racist comments about Barack Obama. Well, um, it took on a life of its own. And as Jim says, well, if you read that chapter in uh, Game Change, which was, a, mm -hmm. as you know, New York Times bestseller, right. they got a whole chapter on that. And that night, there was a rally at, here in Columbia, and Barack was there, um, you know, all the folks are there. I don't know how they know this, or how they got it in the book or who told them, told them it. But Jim um, did. No, Jim didn't know, but it had to be <laughs> Fluff or Axelrod or Robert Gibbs, one of those guys, because they're the only guys backstage with me. Maybe, yes. and, or Jarrett, Barrel Valerie. But uh, Brock came up, gave me a big chest bump, hugged me and said, you are one crazy son of a bitch. And... <laughs> Um, that's in the book, but, but so that's the uh, story of, and by the way, we cleaned everybody's clock that night. Um, in the Good. And, um, I bet you did. Let's, and, you do no, that no, really well. a, big, a big win and it propelled Brock, uh, into the, um, into the presidency. So, um, uh, you know, I'm proud of, of, of the role I played in that. I'm, mm -hmm. uh, and of course, um, I, be, I, you know, I, I became, um, persona non grata with the, uh, the Clintons, even when she ran in 60. I mean, they never asked me to support her, but, um, I'm not, I'm not, never have been from an electoral standpoint, 
a big Hillary fan. I think she she was too polarizing and right. didn't didn't have whatever Barack and Bill and and other folks have supported that sort of connection. Um, she didn't have it. Um, mm-hmm. So so and anyway, I, I, my but, my perspective from from that event, Sarah, is um, well, first the Obama campaign did not want to make race an issue whatsoever. And they went out of their way not to make it an issue in South Carolina. And then, um, and then, you know, Dick accused Clinton of race baiting and all hell broke loose. Dick is up in his office under strict instructions not to talk to anybody about it. And now because <laughs> they, they didn't want to insert race in, into that election. And, and here the race all of a sudden is becoming a huge issue. And then it turns out it was the best issue going forward. And Dick, in hindsight, looked like a um, genius. But at the time, it was not sure. Uh, they were, they were, no, they were very, initially well, very that, concerned. Yeah. So I like, I like how Jim, you know, put in his perspective. But what, what about a Jim story? Um, I think Jim. he's just trying, he's yeah. trying to get away with it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, look, uh, Jim and I uh, have done a number of trials together and there are, you know, stories about what happened during those trials. But um, he has not been politically active in the sense of I, what, I've, why, what I've done. And, uh, you know, I just don't know that I can tell any of the stories without Jim asking y'all to edit it out. Not even the hot tub. OK, well, then. Oh, oh I, no, Jim, can I tell him the hot tub story? All right, tell them the hot tub, Dick. Tell them the hot so tub. So we were taking depositions in Dallas, and we had no Houston, and then we got to go to Dallas. Well, when we got to Dallas, Jim has this horrible back pain, and um, he diag- self-diagnosed pancreatic cancer. Okay, I mean he's 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 he's, he's I was diagnosed. Convinced. Himself, I was convinced. convinced he had pancreatic cancer. So when was or, this? Or, when was this? Or kidney stones, one or the other. Well, but you were you were convinced of pancreatic cancer. This would have been when, Jim? Ten years ago? Probably I don't know, twenty fifteen, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, something like that. But so um I was concerned, but we both have a um a concierge doc that we use and he can hook you up um with a doctor anywhere in the country for specific yeah. things. So uh-huh. um Jim got hooked up with a somebody to do uh, x-rays or CAT scans or whatever. And so he had one done. We were going to Houston uh, the next day. And so he had one done. His back was killing him. He was taking, I think they gave him some sort of muscle Lots relaxer of, or pain pill. Right? Lots of pain pills, yes. Lots of pain pills. So we fly to Houston, I mean Dallas the next day from Houston. And while That's we're, I think either when we land or in the air or whatever, he gets the news. No pancreatic cancer, no kidney stones, probably a pulled, a pulled uh, muscle or something. So as we're checking into the Four Seasons, is that what it was in Dallas we were at? I think it was the Ritz, Carlton. Ritz, Up- well, whatever, some nice hotel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you were, you, were, you, were, you were actually paid on that case. That's good. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah no, no, we were being paid. So <laughs> when we get there, we check in. But our room's not ready, and Jim is just still pretty much in agony. I, uh, and the doctor told him to, you know, take a hot bath or get in a sauna or something. So we could go to the spa while they, you know, readied our room, and we went there, and they had a big old, um, I don't know what you, it's not a jacuzzi, but big enough, you know, it's a like a hot tub, except, you know, big jazz. swimming pool. Yeah, like big, big one. And so, but you couldn't wear clothes in. So... <laughs> So that's Jim's not, in, no, 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 you could wear clothes and we just didn't have any clothes because that's right. That's right. That's right. No, we, had no clothes. we had no, all our clothes. No, and, and you said, I'm sure they'll have some clothes for us in the spa. And they did not. Yeah, and so. and they did not. So Jim's in the, in the pool naked and I walk in naked. And today he will tell you that was one of the most traumatic experiences of his life. Now I've told everybody I got in the hot tub with him and massaged massaged him until there was no more pain. That is all right. I, admit, I made that up totally. But when I tell the story after a couple of drinks, it's, you know, 
Oh God. That's All right. Only. We get, we get the picture. We get the picture. Hey, that's the only story. That's the cleanest story I can tell you. Yeah. Right I, I, yeah that's, I don't know about the visual, but I, I get it. I get it. Um, Okay, so on Murdoch, uh, Dick, you know, we... Well, you jumped in there. Yeah, I did Chief, woo, no more naked guy. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> so on Murdoch, look, uh, you know, this Jim's the boss here. It's his case, your case. And so we have a rule that uh, we don't, you know, really talk about Murdoch um, uh, besides what is already known, you know, so obviously your perspective is important. Um, but you know, uh, we're lawyers first. And so we don't really talk about our, our open cases here. So just so you're, you know, comfortable with with this conversation. Um, but you know, I think what's interesting for listeners and viewers is that there's a lot of movement now in this case, you know, I like you guys and many other people out there, um, never believed that Murdoch committed these murders, nor did I believe that there was sufficient evidence to convict him on the murders. And yet here we are. And so it seems like there's now a pathway to justice. So the first thing I want to ask is, um, you know, I read your motion and I read the state's uh, response and they're like, it's like, they're not talking about the same thing. It's like, you're talking about jury influence and they're talking about jury misconduct. Um, they're two different standards. What is the standard in terms of, you know, this motion? I mean, we know what Becky Hill did. We know what your two jurors are saying under oath, she said. Uh, and now there's three more jurors that they're citing to in this pretty little chart table. Um, what's the standard? I mean, what ultimately when you go before the court, what is the standard that the court needs to adopt? Well, I, I mean, I may oversimplify this and Jim will correct me, I'm sure, if, if I do. But but. The, the big legal debate will be, um, do you have to show, uh, well, first of all, it's got to be uh, uh, clearly a court attache. Most of the cases are bailiffs. I don't think we ever found one involving a clerk of court. Did that person say something um, that would, um, would indicate or instruct the jurors what to think, what to do, um, A, and B, um, you know, did that, did that basically, did that happen? We, we don't have to, we believe we don't have to show that that changed the outcome or influenced the juror. It's just that naked uh, assertion um, by a court attache, uh, that would be a bail of clerk of court, somebody in uh, a police officer who, whose custody they're in, the jury that is. Mm-hmm. Um, and we believe that that is the sta- legal standard for us to, to get after discovered evidence, get a new trial. Jim, you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's essentially when a court official has uh, improper communication with the jury, then it's a different standard. The standard is, was the subject matter of the, of the communication material? Material is measured by, you know, could it have could it have made a difference, not did it make a difference? So you don't have to prove, you know, that the state's making it look like you have to prove that it actually made a difference. You don't have to prove that, right? It's just and that. that and, and, that's the difference, and that's the different standard. When when a juror goes home and gets some, you know, biblical material and brings in the jury room. I mean, and so those are type cases that are out there. And so that's juror misconduct. Jurors bring stuff into the jury room that shouldn't be there, information, what have you. Mm-hmm. And that standard is, you, you, you know, you have to show it, it, it most likely made a difference. But once a court official, you only have to show, could it have made a difference? Yeah, okay. because it's so much more impactful, you know, when it comes from a, a court official. I, I think that, that, that it makes logical sense why the standard would be less stringent than what the state is suggesting. Um, what about the fact that, uh, Dick, they have two, I mean, Three additional uh, jurors, I guess, Sled uh, uh, spoke to. You know, Sarah, I don't think we can discuss the merit okay. of, okay. What's, of what's uh, going on. I'm going to be happy to talk to you about the legal standard, but in terms of weighing the evidence, that's something we're going to have to Got uh, it. argue. Understood. Front. Understood. Um, and then, you know, during the trial, um, I always give Jim a hard time about being a bad boy and opening doors, allegedly. You know, they said, oh, he opened the door. That's why this evidence came in and stuff. And, you know, I know and that not I, I watched that trial from the beginning to the end. Um, but now I think the state's saying there's two bad boys, Dick and Jim, 
because you kind of knew what's happening with this, at least with the Facebook issue, and you waived it. Essentially, that's what I'm seeing that they're arguing. Um, I, I, did you did you know at the time that these communications had occurred, or this is something that you literally learned recently? No, and 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 again, as we've explained in our brief, um, our response to them. Um, the, the, you know, I, I've been doing this 50, 50 years next year. Mm -hmm. I have never in those 50 years seen a clerk of court do anything untoward to a jury. It, it was the, you know, the most unexpected. Uh, I mean, I just assumed everybody was operating in good faith. That would be the yes. bailiff, the judge, the clerk. And so, you know, I basically deferred to them. I, I mean, I always defer um, to the judge uh, when it's, you know, some contested facts, unless I have independent knowledge. Um, and as we've said in the, um, in, in our, in our pleading, um, there was no way for us to have any independent knowledge. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, another issue um, uh, we've raised um, and we'll continue to talk about is, th you know, the, all the issues in the process uh, of at least excluding one juror, SLED was investigating. SWED, the chief prosecutor, the only prosecuting agency uh, in the murder trial, is out at night interviewing witnesses on right. the uh, on the juror disqualification. Do they have a vested interest? Yes, of course. Um, and, and I remember you I, didn't you try to initially when you filed this? I think for a stay in the court of appeals. I think I recall seeking or asking that uh, an investigation be done, but that it not be done by SLED for obvious right. reasons. And that, and that was part of our, I mean, but, but, but I raised the issue in chambers with the judge. You can see the transcript. Why is SLED interviewing these people? Yeah. And, um, you know, and at least one of those SLED agents that interviewed uh, ex, uh, the tenants of the external witness, witnesses was a named witness in the murder trial. I mean, um, and currently the investigations in the, the, um, Statements obtained by the attorney general in their response to our motion were obtained by sled agents. Now they're saying, well, they're, for, you know, they had nothing to do with the murder trial. It's the same agency. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, that's an issue that we, we, we're, we're, uh, we outlined, briefed and yeah. we're well, not only it's the same agency, but you know, that blockbuster moment in the trial that Jim was cross-examining Owens uh, about, you know, the trickery before the grand jury and all that. I mean, it, you know, there were a lot of issues with this agency. And so it's all kinds of layers of conflict, in my opinion. This is my opinion. I'm not the Murdoch lawyer, so I could say what I want to say. I mean, um, Jim, Jim was extraordinarily uh, effective in cross-examining Owens. It's in, the, it's in the transcript. He got Owens to admit that he lied to the grand jury. Yeah, to get yeah. the indictment. Got, got him to admit he fabricated evidence. Now, yeah. um, that Owens was recently recognized by the chief of SWED as the SWED law enforcement officer of the year. I, again, I just think that raises huge questions about the impartiality of that agency to conduct the investigation. The only the other thing I want to point out is this. I've been doing this, as I say, almost half a century. Um, I started when I was 10, but, um, yeah. but <laughs> by the way, I was looking at when you were uh, admitted to the bar 74. Yep. Yeah. I was three. That made me feel really good. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. So it makes me feel really old. But um, <laughs> I have always, not all, but early on, we had some judges whose racial attitudes were horrible. Um, and But they're long gone. But since that era, I've been very proud of the quality of our judiciary and the quality of the process. Um, and until this trial, I really had no questions about the integrity of the process, but this is something that this this our, hopefully our appellate courts uh, will correct, and not something that we're going to have to litigate in federal court five years from now. I, I'm I believe our court understands uh, the issues here and will do the right thing. I do too. You know, I've spoken about this to Jim uh, at length that that your case is was not only fascinating in terms of, you know, the facts and so many people all over the globe were following this and at the trial level, but it is now turned out to be, I mean, all these endless unprecedented twists and turns that are coming up like this whole Becky Hill issue and all that. 
Um, I mean, I, you know, I think it's becoming uh, um, something of, you know, a lot of published opinions, potentially and hopefully some changed laws down there that need to be changed. I, I just see this as far more monumental than just about justice for your client, which is very interesting because, you know, all of the pretrial publicity that you got, the misinformation was, oh, the corruption, the corruption, you know, and it's like, it's sort of uh, the tables I see are starting to turn. But um, another motion that you recently filed um, that everyone's just been kicking and screaming about is uh, what you did call down there prohibition uh, or disqualification of uh, Judge Newman um, simply because of bias, and this is based on your motion that I read, uh, bias, personal and judicial, and also um, the idea that he's a witness to uh, some of the Becky Hill conduct. And there's no ruling on that yet. And there's no ruling on your motion to stay the upcoming financial fraud trial on November 27th. Um, first of all, when do you expect a ruling? I need to know that for personal reasons. But also, uh, what happens if you don't get a ruling? Um, well, we'll, we'll, we'll attempt to pick a jury um, on November 27th. We think that's going to be very difficult. We'll be filing a motion today on that. Um, um, and we'll just go forward with the trial. I mean, it's look, you... you How do you go forward with a trial when you're claiming that the the presiding judge has all of these biases and well, it, it, it definitely will put a different, um, a different approach on it. And it's going to be, um, I don't want to talk about what our strategy, no, be, but, yeah. but, but I will tell you, it will put if, and look, I've known Cliff Newman for 30 years. I'm not, right. we're not saying he's a corrupt or bad guy. We're just saying that he has opinions and he's expressed those opinions and those, uh, the, uh, what he's expressed, we believe, um, should, as, uh, on our motion, uh, ask uh, sh some other judge should hear this matter. He could be a witness um, and he's expressed these opinions. Now, having said that, um, we're going to have to uh, examine uh, every ruling, uh, every, every, every uh, uh, charge, everything the judge does in, the, in that context during a trial. It, put, it puts a different, a different, uh, spin on it as opposed to somebody who hasn't expressed opinions who or who hadn't and i'm not saying i mean i guess i would say but this that, procedurally that, dick but procedurally for those who don't know if you were to be before a judge that you have filed this sort of motion about his recusal and by the way just as a reminder for those people who have not read the motion um Dick and Jim make it very clear that this is, you know, Judge Newman is a very fine judge, that they respect him, that this is not personal. We have to do this. In fact, in California, we get to recuse a judge. We get one bite of the apple, essentially, to paper a judge for no reason at all, not even, you know, no cause at all. So this is very standard. So I've done it, you know, I've, I've known, for example, type of case not going to be good before a specific judge. And we just paper the judge. We don't do it often because, you know, for obvious reasons and optics, but, but it's not personal. So just want to write, but, but if you were before a judge that you have essentially laid out his biases and conflicts, like procedurally, what, like the judge rules on something during the course of your trial, do you go, objection that's biased i mean what how does, no, how does I, I i don't think you objection bias but i think you make make an argument that um that um he's wrong um and why um, right and protect the record on make it. make the record and that, yeah. and, that, and that that objection will be in the context of our previous objection to him as the judge i mean it lays it's an extra layer that's why you know we believe that the that he ought to recuse himself or that the Supreme court ought to step in and right. give us a different judge. But okay. again, and you made that very clear. I think Cliff Newman's a great judge. I think he, yeah. uh, it's just this case um, in which he's expressed opinions um, and could be a witness um, mm. that, that we would have him recused from. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully we'll, we'll know soon, right? It's uh, <laughs> I know you guys are prepared, but it's kind of, always, I, I hate that limbo stage of like not knowing if you're going or not going. And well, it's the Monday after Thanksgiving. So I know you're going to Slovenia, aren't you? No, no. She's coming here. My wife, who's the ambassador of Slovenia is coming home. 
Okay. Yeah. All right. Good. Yeah. So, so uh, Jim and I will probably be eating turkey together a good bit over that weekend. Oh, good. Okay. Mm. Um, so, Jim. Uh, Wait a minute. Talking turkey, right? Right, Jim. Talking turkey. That's right. <laughs> um, you see, on switch switch gears. Um, to gaskets. They, yeah, yeah, we talked about Gaskins in the intro, and you, you're you working on a book about um, your experiences with yeah. Pee Wee Gaskins. Uh, you know, for people who don't know, tell us who Pee Wee is um, and and how you two became um, forever intertwined in the well, and also, uh, Dick, why is he not a serial killer? You know, we, you know, people are following the Gilgo Beach killer and other stories that we've spoken to BTK's daughter here. And, you know, like, uh, you know, on paper, this guy looks like a serial killer. But what's. Well, well, a ser- in my understanding of a serial killer is a killer who repeats killing based on specific criteria, perhaps of the victim perhaps of uh, the timing, uh, all kinds of things that tie all the, these, these murders together. Um, Pee Wee Gaskins killed, um, because Pee Wee Gaskins motive to kill was in most instances, um, he felt some moral reason to do it in his twisted world, or uh, he was afraid somebody was going to turn him in. I mean, these murders were murders of convenience for him. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'll give you an example. Uh, the, the worst one is um, a he had a girlfriend who showed up with a, a two-year-old child at his house. She's pregnant and clearly, and she admitted to him, she was pregnant by a black man and the child was of mixed race. Mm. That crossed the line for Pee Wee. I mean, he was racist would be an understatement. So he invited them down to the pond behind his house. He drowned the mom and then beat the child's head in with a shovel and buried them in the swamp. Um, he had a niece and her friend that showed up on drugs. He got them clean. Um, they uh, did okay for a few months. Came home one night. They were on drugs again. He beat them to death. Um, mm. and got them to tell him where they tell him where they bought the drugs. After he had uh, killed them and buried them, he invited mm. the drug dealer over, which was, who was a woman, um, mm. offered her a, a Coca Cola and had put uh, battery acid in it. Um, killed her. Um, and put her in the uh, septic tank out back. So, I mean, or there's two guys that helped him steal some stuff and he thought they were going to turn him in. So he um, shot both of them in the back of the head. He was five feet tall. He's a little guy. Everybody was bigger than him. So he had to be stealthy um, in what he did. Or, um, you know, he, he uh, there was a sort of a killing somebody as a favor to a woman who you then became romantically involved with it killed her ex-husband. Um, I mean, every one of them is, is a separate story as you'll see in the book uh, on its own, not right. tied to any of the others. Um, not so, the same MO or, you know, correct. so, right. so well, but he, how did you meet him? How did you get involved with him? Okay. So if in the early to mid seventies, a couple of these murders came to light, he was prosecuted, given the death penalty. Furman versus Georgia comes down. And, you know, by way of example, I prosecuted my first death penalty case in 1975. We picked a jury on Monday morning at 10. He was sentenced to death at two o'clock on Tuesday afternoon. No bifurcation, no sentencing here. I mean, it was, if the law was murder was punishable by death unless the jury recommended mercy. Okay, now Furman versus Georgia shut that down and said, you know, you got to have bifurcated. They've got trial with guilt or innocence and then sentencing. Um, so his previous um, uh, previous convictions um, were, were reversed or death sentences. And the prosecutor uh, convinced him and his lawyer that he could still seek the death penalty on the pre Furman cases. Um, obviously, uh, they couldn't, but he was convinced of it, his lawyer was. So he fessed up to eight other murders he committed. And pled all those for life. And that would have been in 1975. So he's um, doing 10 life sentences, eligible at the time, eligible parole in 10 years. Um, he was made the chief trustee of the of the uh, CCI, where the Central Correctional Institution, where he was doing his time. Uh, the first cell block was built in 1848. Um, Sherman, when he 
uh, invaded Columbia, put horse, housed his horses there. But it had been a prison since the 1840s. The cell block in which Pee Wee was in um, was built, I think, around the turn of the century, the, the 19th and 20th century. Um, and he was the building man. He was, an, he was the head trustee. And Death Row was in that cell block. So um, he is approached by, let me sort of digress. Down on the coast, there was an armed robbery and murder of two people called Moon. They had a, a, a son, an adopted son named Tony Simo, who was, who was apoplectic. And he was, they were killed by an African-American from New York named Rudolph Tyner, who was probably borderline, I don't know what the word is today. We, we said back then, retarded. Okay, I don't know what the, is it mentally? It's definitely not the word today. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, mental you know, disabilities, I think. Mental really disability, I don't know what it's called today. I'm, you know, mental delay, yeah. Whatever, but anyway, so um, he was prosecuted, uh, sentenced to death because the prosecutorial uh, exuberance and final argument by the DA down there, it was reversed, retried, sentenced to death again. By this time, Simo is fed up with the system and he wants Tyner dead. So through a third party, he approaches Pee Wee. We have, te- we have taped phone calls between Simo and Pee Wee um, about how to kill this guy. Of course, Tyner was black, so Pee Wee was all in. Um, and so Pee Wee befriended Tyner, gave him drugs, gave him, had food. Uh, and the food food uh, delivery guy was uh, a, um, how can I say this? Um, sexual partner, I guess, of Pee Wee's. Um, He's, an, he, he's another story altogether. Anyway, so... Uh, was Pee Wee uh, gay or he just that was no, a, no, a prison you know, thing? It's, no, it's convenience. Um, yeah. He was very hetero when he was out. Yeah. Um, very, you know, but you got to do what you got to do. But things I change in there, yeah. <laughs> right. So um, Pee Wee tried to... They smuggled some poison in, gave it to him. It just made him sick. He's hearing it on the tape. So Pee Wee says, get me a stick of dynamite and a blasting cap. We'll fit, we'll, there'll be no coming back from that. Simo says... I can't get you dynamite, but I can get you some plastic. That would be plastic explosives. So somehow they smuggle in a quarter pound of C4 explosive and a blasting cap. Um, and he, he makes up this um, fake intercom because he's having to yell at Pee Wee, yell through the vents in the back of the cell to Pee Wee to get food or get whatever he wants. So he has that delivered to Tyner. Um, he's run a wire because he has access to everything from his cell to Pee Wee, uh, to Tyner's cell, and he asked, he, uh, it's a cup with a speaker glued on top, um, and he tells Tyner to hold it up to his ear, can you hear me? And then he plugs his end into the 110 in the wall. It explodes, and he's put nuts, bolts, uh, nails, screws, wow. shrapnel behind that, um, behind that speaker. Um, and it's an unbreakable Department of Corrections um, cup about that tall drinking cup. And so it basically um, blew Tyner's, one of his hands off his head. He lived about 45 minutes. Um, Pee Wee had, if Pee Wee had not taped the phone calls with SEMO, which we found, a guy named Al Waters found when they did a shakedown about a week later, um, he would have gotten away with it. But I think he was getting ready to blackmail SEMO. Um, Pee Wee always thinking. Anyway, so that that is the case I prosecuted him on the execution of a guy on death row um, named named Tyner. Um, the trial took six weeks, um, and in those, during those six weeks, I really got to sort of know Pee Wee because when we take breaks, I'd be in the courtroom. I was working for the DA at the time, so I'm doing the prep work um, and doing some of the witnesses, many of the witnesses, and he's left alone with without his lawyers, and so he's got guards, and I'm there alone and. And we began uh, discussions, uh, not about the case, but um, Pee Wee, for instance, one day says he had a high pitched voice, five feet tall. That's why I was called Pee Wee. He said, Dick, Dick. I said, what Pee Wee? He said, you know, you're a lot like me. Said, what, what, what are you talking about? He said, you like killing. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, you like killing me. He said, I, I can see you really like doing this. I said, no, no, Pee Wee. I'm, I'm here to see that justice is done. And he said, you know, I've spent much of my life in prison. And he said, you know, in, in prison, uh, we think of justice as like a hard dick. He said, your view of it 
is whether you're getting it or giving it. Okay. Now, I mean, is that a philosophy to live by or what? Oh my God. So, and we had many, many conversations. Of course, I really, I mean, I knew Pee Wee was a homicidal maniac, but you know, didn't affect me until, of course, in 90, I ran for DA, got elected. He was to be executed in the spring of 91. I'd just been sworn in. Um, and then we get this call that Pee Wee is a, uh, they, uh, Pee Wee had asked his son to kidnap my four year old daughter and hold her hostage. Wow. And um, he had gone to a friend of his to recruit to help him do it. And that kid went immediately to the sheriff. And then they locked up Pee Wee's son, Donnie, um, and the other kid. And we lived with uh, sweat agents, uh, sort of ironically, for two weeks, making sure there was nobody else trying to do it. But um, the kid gave a statement that, that um, Pee Wee'd asked him to do it two weeks before he was scheduled to be executed and um, that um, he didn't want to do it, but, you know, he wanted his dad. And his dad had a plan where I would, uh, the kid would call me and tell me to have me have Pee Wee brought up to the courthouse, to my office, which the, which corrections and law enforcement would have done if I'd asked for it and that he should, he should be, uh, in my, left in my office, um, alone with me, shackled, whatever. Um, but he knew I had a, it wasn't secret, but I had a back entrance. Not many people knew about, and he could escape, um, go out, mm. out that door. It wouldn't be any, wouldn't be any guards out outside that door. And, so, and Dick, he had a history of escaping, right? Before absolutely. this. A yeah. Look, when he was in a juvenile facility as a kid, 14 year old kid, I read a letter from the superintendent of that facility who indicated he'd escaped, I think, six or seven times. Uh, in one of those times, a little boy that tried to keep him from going, uh, Pee Wee pulled out a knife and cut his finger off, cut the kid's mm-hmm. finger off. So um, he said, it's interesting, he says, this, this young man has homicidal tendencies. This is at 14. And certainly, will kill. <laughs> wow. Nobody paid attention. Nobody paid attention. So Wait, Dick, you, you stayed in touch with him after you convicted him. Well, and- uh, actually, he would call my house. Um, I don't know how he got access to a phone. He was on death row. Uh, my mother was there visiting one time, picked up the phone and says, Dick, there's a guy named Pee Wee on the phone wants to talk to you. I'm like, Pee Wee, don't call my house. What is wrong with you? And Jack Swirling, who was his defense attorney, um, and I went into practice after that trial mm. and uh, he would call the office to talk to Jack and I. And, um, so yeah, I had a number of conversations with it. Um, I actually uh, saw him, I was visiting on an inmate, um, in, not on death row, but they had him in safekeeping and I was in, uh, Jack had a client who was a serial killer named Larry Jean Bell at later executed, who was kidnapping, uh, little blonde girls, um, torturing them, raping mm. them duct taping until they suffocated. He did four of them. Um, but he wasn't my client. He was my partner, Jack's client. Jack was out of town. Uh, The guy was decompensating me, decompensating. He wanted me to go down there and videotape him so he could give it to the, his shrink to look at. Um, and I I was leaving the guard says, Hey, the inmate in the cell next door wants to see you. And I said, really? And so I went over there and it was Pee Wee. And, um, uh, Gaskins was, Oh, Dick, how you doing? I said, well, I'm doing okay. Pee Wee, how about you? And he said, well, I, you know, I'm drawing. And he had these little colored pencil drawings. One of them had like uh, me and Jack, Jack and Dick or, uh, whatever. And, um, Swirling still has a bunch of them. Um, but I said, those are really good Pee Wee. And he said, yeah. I said, I, I said, yeah, they're probably worth some. He said, yeah. And I said, they're probably gonna be worth a lot more real soon. And he got pissed. I mean, intimating that, you know, after an artist dies, they're, um, they're right. working right. for them right. for, and he immediately caught on and I, I'll never forget. He, there were bars between me and him. I me calculating at that moment. If he threw that pencil really hard and hit me in the eye, could he kill me? Um, and so I left immediately thereafter. That was the last conversation I had with him. So this um, is a manuscript. Uh, I mean, this guy was obviously a big part of your career and different, just how different he was. And, uh, um, you have the manuscript for a book that. Well, it's you know, almost, it's, I started probably 20 years after the case. Uh, well, this with this caveat. When, the, when he was, after he was executed, 
Um, the court, I was the DA at the time. The court comes to me and says, we got all this evidence. Some of it just marked for evidence. Some of it was in, introduced in the trial um, in um, evidence. And now he's executed. We don't need to retain it anymore. And we're getting ready to throw it out. Do you want it? And I went down and it was like all the background files, his confessions to the previous crimes, all of that, plus mm. a full sale model of cell block two done by the FBI. Um, mm. The uh, shrapnel they took out of Tyner's brain, uh, the, the piece of equipment that Pee Wee had in his, and all the tapes, 30 of them. Um, so I got those. And then I said, oh, I, look, oh, yeah, I had to do, do a book. And so about once a year, I'd crank some, I about had like uh, probably 35 pages done after 10 years. So I reached out um, probably two years ago, um, uh, had an agent, um, and they reached out to get me a, what we thought was going to be a ghostwriter. Right. Um, um, a guy named Sean Assel who has a, had a New York Times bestseller mm-hmm. on Sonny Liston, and there was a documentary done by, I guess, Netflix on, on the basis of the book. And he and I have been working together for about two years, and um, he's no longer a ghostwriter. He's my co-author. Um, um, and uh, he's done an extraordinary job working with me, trying to develop this because it's not just the Pee Wee story. It's my story too. Yeah. yeah. So, um, telling I, I, your story through a case, but also I think given all the material that you have, I mean, that's just, it's, it's so great for not just a book, but also, um, some sort of a, uh, documentary or something because yeah, i want to hear that audio man that sounds yeah that sounds no the, audio, the audio's uh pretty chilling but um yeah. anyway so we're about done with it it's uh going through an editing process hopefully i'll have something the next week or two um and um i have an agent sylvie rabineau with uh, millennium who is uh, working on getting it published that's awesome so, I mean, listen, Dick, uh, I, uh, I was telling Jim, I could listen to you for hours. You're the best storyteller and you have so much to impart to all of us. Um, and so obviously you're a friend of this platform. Uh, it's Jim's platform. And um, we hope that you come back and join us, um, you know, on when your book is out, on other stories. Um, and, you know, hopefully the next conversation there'll be... Um, you know, we'll be talking about justice for Murdoch. Uh, things hopefully will will go the way they should. So, and hopefully, we'll hear the waitress story as well. I know you need to oh, yeah. save some for your next appearance. By the way, my it. back is really hurting. I'm thinking I might need a hot tub or a pancreatic scan. <laughs> really, I pulled something. Oh, anyway. he was dying. He was dying. I mean, it was he was ready. He was he was suicidal. He his back hurt him so bad. He thought pancreatic cancer was going to take him in the next four weeks. <laughs> That's funny. True, um, true story. Anyway, uh, Dick, thank you so much for joining us. I, I really, really thank appreciate you for inviting it. me. I, I, um, um, you know, obviously, I talk to Jim every day. I don't get to talk to you every day, though, Sarah. So this is no, a, we'll a, talk. A this is a <laughs> All right, thank you so much, and um, we will be back with another great episode. But until. Next week. Well, first of all, Matt's got something to say. We got to get subscribers, listeners. Oh, yeah. If you, this is your first time checking out the show, welcome to the fold. Please subscribe. We're on all the podcast platforms, we're on all the social media platforms at The Presumption. And these episodes are on YouTube. So you can see uh, Jim's face while uh, Dick was trying to tell those stories. It's, it's worth a watch. <laughs> YouTube.com slash at The Presumption. So we thank you guys and, for your support. And Jim, until next week, we rest. We rest. Yeah.